I want to um, read to you a passage of scripture, and I want to build this lesson around this passage this way. Would you read with me Hebrews chapter 4? We're going to con- consider what's said from verse 14 to the end of the chapter. I believe that if there's a central message that is necessary for today's generation, it is the message of forgiveness. I think that one of the hardest things for us to both accept and to give is forgiveness. I think the greatest tool that we have, the greatest weapon we have at our disposal with respect to spiritual weapons of effectiveness in fighting the enemy, it is forgiveness. I think that one of the greatest expressions of love to other people and to ourselves is forgiveness. And I believe our greatest need is forgiveness. Those of you who would agree with me, could I hear you say, oh yeah. All right, and in verse 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. What confession? And we believe Jesus has entered into the heavens, has passed through, and is actually the Son of God, the one who was crucified and raised from the dead. You know, we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every way, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. It kind of disturbs me sometimes, and I've done it myself because I get caught up in words when I'm in front of a group and and the nervousness gets us to say things that we don't necessarily mean and we use words that we don't really intend to use. But when we pray, God, please forgive me of or forgive us of our weaknesses, you realize if you're guilty from your weakness, then Jesus was guilty and His sacrifice is worthless. Weakness is not the problem. Weakness is the cause. Weakness opens the door. But you're not guilty of a weakness. You're guilty of the sin committed because of the weakness. Jesus shared our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way like we are, in every kind of sin. Think about that for just a moment. Every kind of sin, Jesus was tempted. What does the word tempted mean? Doesn't it mean he had the desire? How can you be tempted to do something that you have no desire to do? It's not a temptation to you. I have no desire to get drunk. I held the head of one of my very good friends while he puked up his guts because he was so drunk. Nearly died of alcohol poisoning and didn't realize that he had drunk that much, I left him in the bathtub covered in his own vomit. I thought, never will I do this. I have no desire. I mean, the smell alone of just the alcohol is just enough for me. I don't like the taste. I don't like the, the results. Personally, I've sipped a little, drunk a little. I'll never be drunk. Not a temptation for me. Some of you, that's a huge temptation. I get it. Because that's not my area of weakness, but my area of weakness you may not relate to. We all share weaknesses, but Jesus was in every category of weakness. This says, I believe that's what this scripture is communicating. He had the desire to do wrong, and yet he did not do it. He was without sin, the last part of that verse says. So verse 16, let us then with confidence... Draw near, and that word is keep on drawing near, nearer and nearer and nearer. Draw near to where? The throne of grace. Somebody said grace makes a great acrostic, G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. We draw near to the throne of grace. Whatever it is that you need at the time that you need it, God's grace provides though you don't deserve it. That's grace. Now watch the rest of this in. So that, now we're dealing with weaknesses and sin. 
right? Those two things are the top priority of this passage. Watch what happens as we draw near to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If I read that correctly, well, let me ask you this. When do you need mercy? When does anybody need mercy? It's when you blow it, right? It's when you sin, when you've disobeyed, when you've done something wrong, you throw yourself at the mercy of the court. Please, Your Honor, don't give me what I deserve. I want mercy, not justice, when it comes to me and my failure. When somebody else, I want to see justice done, right? Bring out the rope. Put him on the electric chair. Let's flip the switch. I want to see justice done in those points. Well, when it comes to me, I throw myself at the mercy of the court. And this passage says you can go to the throne of grace with confidence. Why? Because you have a high priest who completely understands. He has faced every temptation, kind of temptation that you have faced. He knows what it is to have the desire He knows what it is to be weak, and he paid for your sin. As Vic says, thank you for being the payment, the payment, not a down payment, the payment, the complete payment for our sin. I need mercy when I blow it. When do I need grace? Before I blow it. That's what this says. Mercy... Find mercy and grace in when? Time of need. So I'm faced with the temptation. I turn to God for grace, which is God's riches at Christ's expense. God providing what I need when I need it, though I don't deserve it. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside me. Is there a powerful force at work able to help me overcome sin at this point? Where's our issue then? If I have the power of Jesus himself to help me overcome sin, and I don't use the power to help me overcome sin, where's the issue? Is the issue with him? Is the issue with the power? No, the issue's got to be with me and my, my perception, my understanding. Now, go backward two, two chapters in Hebrews. Do you have your Bibles? You're reading with me. Hebrews chapter 2, I want you to read the last verse. Let's start in verse 14, actually. Chapter 2, verse 14. Hebrew writer has already given us the clue of how to access grace in time of need. Watch. Verse 14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, that'd be us. You and I are flesh and blood creatures. Now, what does that mean to the Hebrew writer? We're weak. Weak as water. All right. Flesh and blood. He himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. So many are scared to die. And you become a slave to the fear of dying. But his death and resurrection is to release us from slavery of the fear of death. You don't need to tremble when you shake the mortician's hand. He may be the last man to ever let you down, but he's not going to be, right? He's not going to be the final word. Because God is the one who brings you up. And if Jesus was brought out of the grave, you and I will be as well. Who through fear of death were subject for, to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not the angels that he helps. Well, then who does he help? He helps the offspring of Abraham. That's us. Children of Abraham by faith. We are his descendants. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Every respect. 
so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation, which is really a great $500 word that means this. He's the sacrifice that took the full weight of God's wrath on his own back. God's wrath, we deserve it all on our own back. But if you and I were to stand and receive the wrath of God, we'd be fried like toast. Gone. Evaporated. We just couldn't take it. The full wrath of God. You're gone. But Jesus stepped in between, and he took the full measure of the wrath of God on his own back for you so that you could take his righteousness. He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Second Corinthians 5, 21. Check me out. So then, he's the propitiation for the sins of the people. He's dealt with the sins of our past. True? Has he dealt with the sins that you committed since you walked in these doors? True? Has he dealt with sins that you haven't even thought of committed, committing yet? Has he died for those? And have you, have you, are you forgiven of those? Yes, it is finished means just that. He died for all sin. And by the way, I know that's true because you see, he died for the sins of your past, but he did it before you were in the future. He already died for the sins that you have yet to commit. He's the propitiation for our sins. Verse 18 now becomes, what what does he do? What does he do to help us? deal with our own weakness, our own proclivity to sin. For because he himself has suffered, when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. We have a double cure for sin. Number one, he forgives and he forgives it all. Number two, he gives power so that you don't do it again. And the only reason you and I would fall into temptation and into sin, that is our weakness leads us into sin. The only reason is because we don't think ahead that we're going to call on Jesus so that we don't sin. Call on his name. All who call on the name of the Lord should be saved is more than just saved from hell, saved from sin past. It's saved that you won't have to sin. You're not a slave to sin any longer. You can choose to ask Jesus for help. I love that. And here's how it works. You're walking to the store one day. You see the pornographic magazine on the left. You're walking, uh, you, you flip on the television set, and, and it goes to a, to a commercial or to an ad that now has got your mind. You're saying, oh, I don't want that, but I do. And whatever the that is, and your mind is already filled in whatever the that is for you in the temptation area where you, where you fall. Think ahead. When those times happen, I'm going to ask Jesus, please help me. Help me to do the right thing. Help me not to sin here. Help me to choose this instead of that. Plan ahead. I think he said something like that, didn't he? Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. See, if the prayer just focused on del- deliver us, or rather lead us not to temptation, what are you thinking of? You're thinking of temptation, aren't you? But deliver us from the evil one, now what are you thinking of? See, so said, think ahead. Plan ahead, pray ahead, and call on him when you are faced with temptation. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 18. Both are grounded in this. He is the sympathetic high priest. He knows what you're going through. Based on his own power of he took the heat for you, he was raised from the dead, he is the all-powerful, almighty God of the universe, and he now has moved in to live inside of you. You have a resource inside you now to help you deal with temptation in a way that you don't have to keep on sinning. You don't have to. Plan ahead. Secondly, when you do blow it, 
when you do, as soon as you can at that point, let God's grace and mercy give you what you need the most, forgiveness. Grace, he provides what you need and you don't deserve it. What does he need? What do you need when you blow it? Mercy. And so the woman was caught in adultery. They dragged her through the town. They brought her before Jesus. John chapter 8, they said to Jesus, this woman's been caught in adultery. The law of Moses says stone her. What do you say? And Jesus didn't answer them. He just simply got down on his knee and began to write on the dust and the, and the sand. He's, he's, I, we don't know what he wrote. Some say he doodled. Some say he wrote out the commandments. Others say he wrote out names of people who were there and what they've done as well. I don't know. What did he do? What did he write? All I know is this. The eyes were on the woman. The eyes were on Jesus. What are you going to do about her and her sin? And then Jesus stood up. Because, you see, he did something masterful. He took their eyes off the sinner and possibly onto themselves. He certainly did with this statement, didn't he? All right. You're right. She deserves to die. That's what the law says. You who are without sin, you be the first one to take the stone and kill her. You start the process. And then he got down on his knee again and began to write in the sand. And he's looking down, but he can hear the shuffle of the feet, the dropping of the rocks. And it says, the scripture says, from the oldest to the youngest. Probably because they were far more aware of their own sin. But they dropped their stones. And then Jesus stood. Now the only, two, the only two eyes, the only set of eyes that matter, he's looking at the woman and he said, where are your accusers? They're all gone, Lord. Okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to accuse you either. You're forgiven. Now, don't do this anymore. Stop it. And I believe that, personally, I think she's the woman I think in Luke 7 it is where the woman comes in and cries on Jesus' feet and dries his feet with her hair. She's overwhelmed. She comes back and worships Jesus for what he's done. The question is, what gives him the right to forgive sins? Because that was the issue in Mark chapter 2 that was read, right? The, The paralytic was brought down in front, and Jesus, they were hoping that he would heal him. Well, what did Jesus do? He didn't heal him, did he? Well, not right off. He said, your sins are forgiven. Which leads me to think that it was because of the guy's activity and sin that led him to the accident that paralyzed him. I don't know. But if you had a choice between the ability to walk again and complete forgiveness of sins, which would you choose? Well, he's had a lot of time to contemplate his own failures in life. He's had a lot of time to contemplate how far away he is from God and has God completely abandoned him. There's a, there is, a, there is a, a way of thinking that bad things happen when we do bad things. That is, what, it, it may be totally unrelated, but I've done all this bad, so that's why I'm paralyzed now. So he's, maybe he's in that mindset. God has rejected me. He's holding this against me. And Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven. I think he looked up at his friends and says, take me home. I got more than I came for. Whether I walk or not is secondary to the most important need of my life. I'm forgiven. And they whisper among themselves and they're thinking inside, How does this man think? Who does he think he is? God? Only God can forgive sins. I hear Jesus saying inside, yes. (laughs) So I think I am. And so he asks the question, which one is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, take up your bed and walk? Well, count the words and count the syllables. Even in English, it's almost the same. Your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. 
They're just about easy. Either one of them are easy to say, right? Can you see forgiveness of sins? No. It's invisible. Your sins are forgiven. That's an invisible statement. It's like saying, I love you. Can you see love? No, you see the effects of love, but you don't see love itself. You don't see forgiveness. So the question is, which one of these can you see? Your sins are forgiven. Take up your bed and walk. If I say, take up your bed and walk, and he does, then that proves that what you cannot see is actually real. And I must be who you claim I am. Take up your bed and walk. So you can know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth. Take up your bed and walk. And he immediately, strength was back in his legs, his body was full, and he was able to get up and walk. He rode up the mat, he walked out of the house, and people just stood back, and most of them praised God. Others just scratched their head and walked away saying, this guy's full of demons. I figured that one out. Demons don't forgive. Here's where, um, here's what I want you to see. That Jesus forgave the sins of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus forgave the sins of a man who, watch it, he didn't even ask for forgiveness. In fact, neither one of them asked for forgiveness. Jesus was eager to forgive. My son says, and I've quoted him before, I love this statement. God is a lot better at forgiving than you are at sinning. He is more eager to forgive than you are to sin. So when you do sin, don't allow the satanic forces now to come in and and work on you this way. When you've sinned, here's the thought process that the satanic forces introduce to our mind. And you call yourself a Christian. Who are you fooling? Come on. Christians don't even think about doing these things, let alone do them. Who do you think you are? At church, fooling everyone, thinking that you're holy, 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 right. Sure you are. Under that mask, you know who you really are. And you're pretending to be somebody that you're not. That's when you need to respond to the satanic forces with the promises of God. I stand forgiven. I am a child of God. I have the Holy Spirit. So I've blown it, but I turn to God for forgiveness, and he has forgiven me. It's been nailed to the cross, and Jesus said it's finished, and the blood is covered, and I am forgiven, and I'm fine with God. And then you remind the satanic of their future as they think they're reminding you of their past, of your past. Here's the kicker. If you can accept the forgiveness of God, the complete, total, overwhelming forgiveness of God that fills your heart with joy, and I believe love. Who who loves more? The person who's forgiven just a little bit or the first person who's forgiven a great amount? Jesus asked that question. What's your answer? The one who's forgiven a little or the one who's forgiven a lot? The one who's forgiven a lot loves more. Now, let me ask you this. Have you been forgiven a little or have you been forgiven a lot? A lot. Do you love him? The expression of love, the fullest, more mature expression of love is forgiveness. Even when It's not requested. For forgiveness is up to the forgiver, not the forgivee. It is available. Forgiveness is available. Now, I can forgive someone. Say, Tommy has hurt me deeply. And I forgive him. But until he turns to receive the forgiveness or ask for forgiveness or accept that forgiveness... Until he does that, we have no relationship that can be based on forgiveness. That that sin, that hurt, stands between us. From my vantage point, no. I want relationship. That's what forgiveness does. It can reestablish relationship. In fact, it's the basis of that. So if I forgive, I'm offering to him. When he turns, it's already there. 
When he turns to respond, forgiveness is already given. And the only reason you have the ability to do that is because of Jesus' death and the application of his death in your life. You're operating, you're, you are operating from the forgiven position, not from a guilty position offering to another guilty person forgiveness. You can't. You need to accept the forgiveness of Christ. Let him take through his nails the full penalty. Then what I do is I look through the nails of Jesus to Tommy and I say, regardless of what he's done, regardless of what he's done, I look through the nails of Jesus and I say, forgiven, the penalty's been paid. Now, for us to have a relationship, he needs to accept it. God has offered full forgiveness, true? In order for you to enjoy the relationship with him, you've got to receive it. But when you do, then he expects you from the full love effect from your heart to offer the same kind of forgiveness to others. He gave that in a parable when he said about this slave who was forgiven and then a great deal, $10,000. But he went out and he held somebody who owed him $100 and threw him in jail. And God said, the, the, the rich man said, you throw him in jail until everything's paid, he and his whole family. And then Jesus said these words, the Father in heaven will treat you the same way if you do not forgive from your heart. I don't know many other passages of Scripture that says God will take away your forgiveness based on something that you do. This is it. You refuse to forgive and hold, hold this hostility and anger and bitterness in your heart toward anyone. So how, how do you do that? This is not easy. I'm not saying that it is. But it starts with you wrestling with that at the cross of Jesus and nailing that person along with the sin at the cross of Jesus. The most powerful weapon in your arsenal is forgiveness. Because when you truly forgive from the heart, someone who has hurt you deeply, it melts their hearts. So church, has this been encouraging? Has it been helpful? Then let's be people known for our forgiveness. Get in the habit of forgiving. Get in the habit. Not just look at, it at the person and say, well, they didn't mean it, or I understand the circumstances. But look through the cross. Look through the nail holes of the cross. Look through the handprints and the footprints of the nail holes in the hands and the feet of Jesus. Look through those to the person and say in your own heart, paid in full. The penalty has been met. If God can forgive, then I can forgive with the same basis is through the death of Jesus. That's the most powerful tool. And by the way, the greatest spiritual weapon we have, the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. We've been looking at now three weapons and truth, light, love, and now forgiveness. And uh, I hope that you are much more equipped than you were when we began this series. Do you need forgiveness personally? Do you need to turn to the Lord and ask him for forgiveness? Do you need to turn and confess your sins? Then while we're singing this song in your own heart, wherever you are, just simply do that. Just, God, I lay this before you. Thank you for Jesus and thank you for forgiving me. If you have yet to be baptized in the Christ, today is your birthday. Why let Olivia celebrate alone? Why not you celebrate your spiritual birthday today? Start today by full surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, responding to him in love, dedicating you, yourself to learn how to live through him. He is your Lord. You love him. You're learning to live as he wants you to live. And that's what we're calling you to do as a disciple. So let's pray. Lord, as we are about to sing, I pray you'll penetrate our hearts with your love and forgiveness and help us 
especially if we have difficulties with someone in our own family, that you would work in us a deep forgiveness from our heart. Train us, Lord. Help us learn how to do that and live it and to, and to bathe ourselves in your mercy and your forgiveness. Thank you for that, and thank you for setting us free. Setting us free from the slavery of the fear of death. We're looking forward to the day you come back, Jesus. So come quickly. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.